into and onto functions. Now, you might see a, a rather strange notation, f followed by a colon and then an a with an arrow pointing at b. a and b are sets, and f is a function. Now, this is, in other words, this is a kind of function notation where the domain and range are treated as sets of numbers. So, we're, t we're just saying that a rule f is used to map a member of set a onto a member of set b. Um, and, of course, we mean all members of set a onto some members of set b and um, a and b are sets of numbers. Now that means that uh, there's a rule uh, f which assigns to each element of a set a some element in set b. In this illustration f of 0 is 3, f of 1 is 3, and f of 4 is 7. Or 0 is mapped into 3, 1 is mapped into 3, and 4 is mapped into 7. Notice here that nothing is mapped into 5. Uh, all elements of a are used up as is necessary for a function but it's not true for b necessarily. We can say the function f assigns to each element of a some element of b, or the elements of a are each mapped into some image of b by f. We also don't run into situations where f will require us to map the same element of a into more than one element of b. This produces a rather strange ambiguity in our mapping. Notice here that a, uh, element uh, called 1, is mapped onto both 0 and 5 as if to say f of 1 is 0 and f of 1 is 5, which is not allowed for a function. However, the opposite is not true. Uh, it is quite acceptable to say f of 2 is 7 and f of 4 is 7, as is, in, as is suggested in this illustration. The definition of a function requires that one value of a, the domain, leads only to one value in b. That is, functions prohibit a value in a from having two different images in b. Notice that the reverse doesn't break any rules. Notice that the two elements in A are mapped into the same image in B. All that is needed to satisfy how the function is defined is that each element of A is mapped into some image in B. If they happen to be the same value, then so be it. Set A is called the domain of F. Set B is called the range of F. You might have noticed that not all members of B were used in the range of F. Notice for example, 5 is not used. And that is one element that is not an image member of A. Now, as in this illustration, it looks like you could define a new set that includes only the numbers 3 and 7 as being the image values for set A, or for, for function F. And we could call that set C. And this subset actually has a new name. We actually can call that actually the image of f. Whereas set b is the range of f. Now set a, as expected, would be the domain of f and it doesn't have an alternate name. But set b is the range of f and the subset containing the numbers 3 and 7 are the image of f. If the image and range are the same set, in other words no elements left out, we call that a non-to function. But the one you see here where there is, uh, where the image and the range are not really the same set of numbers, uh, that's called an into function or a function which is not onto. In order to have an onto function, all the numbers in both the domain and the range must be used up. Well, let's uh, define set A as being uh, containing the numbers 0, 1, and 4, and set B as containing the numbers 3, 7, 5, 9. And let's uh, draw um, arrows associating. Um, 0, 1, 4 with uh, members of set B. As if, you know, we're just trying to define a function here, f, which uh, applies this rule from set A to set B. And notice that the function is 1 to 1, but it's not onto. It's not onto because not all members of set B are used up, but all, set, all members of set A are. It is a 1 to 1 function. Now, set, now we'll draw another 1 to 1 function defining set A and B as having, say, equal, equal amounts of numbers. And um, here, we're just going to draw arrows from 0 to 3, 1 to 7, 4 to 5, and 6 to 9. Now, this new function is both onto and one to one. 
In this case, if we reverse the arrows, it will still be a function and an inverse exists. Well, for our next uh, little bit, we're going to take a look at uh, piecewise functions, or functions as they exist in science, nature, and the real world. And suppose we're studying a distance which an object falls and which hits the ground after t sub g seconds. Its function may be defined as f of t, s of t equals 0 for t less than 0, 16t squared for t between 0 and t g, which... Uh, we took to be 3 in the initial graphic, and 16t squared g uh, for all t greater than t sub g. This is just saying that the object doesn't fall until t equals 0, and the object begins to fall until it hits the ground at time t sub g, according to the rules given by 16t squared. Afterward, once it hits the ground, it can't fall any further, so its distance fallen will remain constant at 16t squared g, and from then on, its graph will look like this. Most often in a lab, time extends for a predetermined length long enough to prove or disprove a hypothesis. Unlike pure mathematics, time rarely goes forever in both directions, since that is impractical in a lab situation, even when the formula used is a polynomial. A falling body usually has a time where it begins to fall and a time where it stops falling. Similarly, all experiments based on time have a starting point and an end point in which to make a time-based measurements. In real life, in most real life situations, time is a finite interval which is connected in a meaningful way to what you are studying. Notice that in S of t, the interval between t 0 and tg seconds, the function actually is in fact 1 to 1. There is no point on that interval where the height is the same for two different times. This is not true in the other intervals. For them, you will find the same s value for any two values chosen inside those intervals. That is, for example, when t is greater than t sub g, the distance fallen will always be the constant 16 t squared g. We have an example here of a closed interval that where x is a number between a and b, and we just write a comma b surrounded by square brackets, and this tells us that the endpoints are not are included. If the endpoints are not included, then we write a comma b in between round brackets, and we call that an open interval. Sometimes we can go halfway and write x between a and b as closed on A but open on B, meaning that B is not part of the, strictly part of the interval. Now let's go back to our piecewise function and see if we can rewrite the intervals in interval notation using the round and square brackets. Well for one thing, uh, t less than or equal to 0 is open on minus infinity but closed on 0. t between 0 and tg is open on 0 because it was closed on 0 in the last interval and, op and clo sorry, yes, and closed on tg. Now, where t is greater than tg, uh, that interval is open both on tg and on infinity because tg was already closed in the previous interval. So infinity is always shown in interval notation as open since it's not an actual number. The domain of s is the union of all three of these subintervals, in effect saying that uh, the domain of the function as a whole is between minus infinity and infinity or the set of all real numbers. Neighborhoods of some value c refer to numbers near to c. The terminology of neighborhoods helps us discuss the behavior of a function near c as x approaches c either from the left or from the right. This can be seen by picking any open interval a to b where c lies inside. By extension, c is not allowed to be equal to a or b itself, since we had just said that a and b are in an open interval are at the ends of an open interval and thus lie outside of the open interval just defined. To study the behavior of a function of f at c, the idea is to evaluate the limit as x approaches c from the left and the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x. Most often, c lies exactly in the middle between a and b in what is called a symmetric neighborhood. To make it symmetric, we can pick a number h so that the interval a b becomes the interval 
c minus h to c plus h, guaranteeing that c lies smack in the middle. There can also be situations where x equals c forms a vertical asymptote, meaning that f is undefined at c. If we now wish to study the behavior near c, the interval cannot include c itself, which may very well lie in a symmetric neighborhood. When c is excluded from a neighborhood in which it lies, we call that a deleted neighborhood. To illustrate, let's look at the function f of x equals x squared minus 9 all divided by x minus 3. You will notice that at x equals 3, we get f of x equals 9 minus 9 divided by 3 minus 3, which is 0 over 0, which is undefined. Studying its limit, we can avoid left and right limits by doing some cancellation and evaluating the limits by direct substitution. That is, the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x equals the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 3 times x minus 3 divided by x minus 3. Notice that x minus 3 cancels, and all we're left with is the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 3, which amounts to 3 plus 3, which is 6. If we understand that the limit applies to values near 3, then the point 3, 6 gives the location of the hole in the graph at the original f of x, that is, the unreachable point that resulted in 0 over 0 in the first place. Another interpretation is that if I pick any x near 3 but not 3 itself, f of x will approach a value near 6 but not 6 itself. Both of these interpretations of deleted neighborhoods are equally valid and important. Selecting values in a symmetric neighborhood between A and B involves choosing values where the absolute value of B minus A is less than 2H, where A and B are the endpoints of the open interval AB, and H is the distance between C and either A or B. The vertical bars surrounding the absolute value of b minus a denote absolute value, or the distance b minus a is from zero. Absolute value can be defined by the formula absolute b minus a equals the positive square root of the square of b minus a. By this notation, we only take the positive square root. This has the effect of making any number positive regardless of its original sign. In practice, we just strip the minus sign if it is there. For example, the absolute value of minus 5 is the same as the absolute value of 5, which is the same as positive 5.